wrap up for a, come out again for lunch and go to the next day. Thanks for doing this. Ah, uh, no problem. Never turned on the opportunity to talk about ego network data. <laughs> All right, it's my great pleasure to have Jeff Smith um, back, back to Durham. Um, uh, Jeff got his PhD here. Whoa, sorry, me. Um, what did he decide three years ago? Ah, uh, yeah, it's been yes. three and years. And has been um, just knocking it out of the park at the University of Nebraska. Um, he's worked extensively on network software issues, network data quality issues, and um, really sort of pr um, pushed the field forward in the area of ego network analysis. And as I was saying this morning, the ego networks are really great from a data collection and your privacy and IRB standpoint, because you don't have to worry about record linkage in the same way. And um, if you can do interesting things with them, all the better. And Jeff's going to be here to tell us what the interesting things are we can do. So, okay. Yeah, well, thank you. So it is my pleasure to present the Ego Network uh, part of this larger workshop on social networks and health. Uh, it is a topic dear to my heart, so this will be a, hopefully be fun. So how many folks, just as a curious, already have or have have ego network data or would be interested in potentially using it? Okay, fair amount, good. So this would be uh, either uh, terribly redundant or, or useful, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. But uh, okay, so let me, let me just start off with um, kind of laying out the structure of the course. So we have two hours, um, give or take. And so I'm gonna start with what I'm calling uh, preliminaries. So, you know, a little bit about definitions and some motivation. And um, what you know, what does the ego network data look like? Just on the off chance that we uh, uh, we, we we don't know, and so just give a make sure we all have uh, basically on the same um, same starting point, same uh, same language, uh, and the like. Um, okay, so a little bit of uh, data and motivation, and then second part uh, analysis. So once we know you know what ego network data look like and why it's so great, and also some of the limitations and problems. Uh, what you know? What can we do with it? And um, you know, this third part really should be sort of a sub part of analysis, um, kind of part of both uh, part one and part two. Are uh, going to have this in the sort of back of our minds. Um, what specifically can we do uh, related to health? Okay, so ego network data is a general form of data that we could use. Um, what type of specific health related questions uh, can we answer? And so that's going to be basically layered throughout the. Uh, this first part on preliminaries and second part on data analysis. Okay, and so the last part, which uh, uh, I'm planning on, uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll have an hour or so. I'm not quite sure exactly how long this will take, but uh, hopefully we'll leave a good hour for some actual uh, demonstration. So how to actually do this? How to actually do this stuff uh, in R? Okay, so you have ego network data, um, you put it into R. You know, now what? Um, and so. Much of that, uh, as we'll see, is just getting the uh, data into a form that, going from essentially traditional survey data into something that looks like a network, and that actually ends up being, uh, and perhaps not surprising, or maybe it is. Oh no, harder than harder than we think. Um, and so we're going to spend some time just on data management and uh, and how to get something useful out of uh, uh, ego network data. Okay, and so that's the that's the plan. Uh, with that in mind, the goals should be pretty obvious. Um, one should give some sense of what ego network data looks like. Uh, a little bit of background on you know, measurement and models and um, specific applications to health. And then uh, some familiarity with, well, as much familiar familiarity as you can get in um, you know, an hour um, uh, about doing this um, in R. And my hope is, and I think it will be, I think it's going to tie in very well with what uh, uh, as Jacob uh, already did in the first part and what he's going to do uh, afterwards. So hopefully that'll be a nice uh, nice tie-in and everything I learned about uh, lists and functions will be um, uh, uh, clearer as we get some actual uh, practice doing it. Okay, so that's the that's the thought. Okay, so let me first begin uh, with definitions and you know uh, preliminaries just to make sure that we are um, we are all on the same page uh, going forward. And I'm not quite sure how much of this you've already seen. Uh, if you've already seen all this, uh, we're going to see it again anyway, so that's okay. Um, all right, so definitions. Um, so typically, ego network data is uh, basically seen as, uh, or you could treat it, think of it as a counter to uh, full network data. So first, 
what do we think of as whole network data? Well, you have uh, all the nodes or all the respondents in a context, as well as all the ties between them, right? That's what we typically think of uh, when we work with full network data. We think of network data as what we're typically thinking about, right? If you go into a school, add health, right? This is what we're gonna work with uh, later in the, the workshop, right? Um, you interview all the respondents and you say who their friends are and then you can map out all the connections between all the people in the school. That's what we may typically have. Um, ego network data, uh, different, okay? So this is the counter, right? So ego network data is, uh, rather than being interested in the structure of the entire network, right, all the actors and all the ties between all the actors, uh, we're interested in, right, hence the name, uh, ego, right? One, one focal respondent. Um, you may have lots of focal respondents, but when you analyze the network, right, what you actually have is a focus on a single case, basically. And so what does that mean? Um, you're basically focusing on a particular individual, a particular node or respondent. So my language is terribly inconsistent, but uh, that's why I put slashes everywhere. Uh, just have to get used to it. Um, so I'm saying node or respondent, um, but the idea here is we're going to focus on a particular case, particular person, and we're interested in all the ties that um, that is involved with that particular ego or that particular respondent. Um, and so in terms of language, ego is our focal respondent, the person we um, are particularly interested in, their social world, right? That's who we care about at the moment. Um, the language, uh, alter, okay, so if you've seen these in papers, uh, alters are all the people that are connected to ego. Um, so in our little example here, we have the ego, right? Uh, not too surprising, is at the center. And these are all, let's say, all the friends of ego names, um, A, B, C, and D, for lack of, uh, for lack of creativity. Um, and so by definition, right, everybody in ego network is connected to ego, right? That's, that's the way it's constructed. Um, and so that's our alters, and then we also have Sometimes, not always, uh, not always, um, the ties between alters, okay? And so, and so I have uh, conveniently uh, drawn these as a different, different color here. These are the ties that uh, connect our alters. So in this case, alter A is friends with alter B, and alter A is friends with alter D. Um, and that sort of goes beyond the ties that simply emanate from our focal respondent, okay? So to put, um, make this a little more concrete, what do we not have, right? Another way of thinking about this. Uh, well, we basically don't have right, anything that goes beyond that one step from, from our ego. Um, so for example, if person C had three other friends uh, that were not friends of ego, we wouldn't know that, right? So this is purely local, it's purely a personal network. We only know um, ego and the person they're connected to. Everything else, uh, is basically a uh, blank box. We don't, we don't know. So what does that look like? Um, okay. Uh, well, again, the contrast between the full network over here and what we're actually gonna be working with over there. Um, and so you can see in the full network, right? We have so it's kind of a messy picture, but you know all the nodes, all the individuals. Imagine this was a classroom, a classroom network or a school. I should say I think it's a grade. Um, Okay, so you have all the actors and all the ties between them. That's what we typically think of as you know, a network picture, right? Um, and so that's going to be what we expect and we typically work with. But uh, this, this over here, is what we're actually going to be working with. And so what, what happens going from, from here to there? Well, uh, you can imagine uh, essentially taking a sample, right? So this is pieces of the network or a sample of the network. And so imagine we're sampling the network, in this case, the, the red nodes are our egos. They're the people that we are focusing on, okay? And so imagine we grab this person over here. They're part of the full network. We grab them. Um, we only are interested in the, the connections directly uh, from that ego. He has two, or she, who knows, uh, two friends, and we grab them, and we put them, put them over here. Anything going beyond, right, any ties between the alters and other other uh, friends is totally ignored. We don't have it. We're only focused on the little piece of the network that uh, is directly involved with ego. Everything else, right, we don't have, okay? And so conceptually, what's, the, what's important here is that ego networks, um, <coughs> we, 
you don't always think of it like that, but what they are is basically a sample of a larger network. It's a piece, right? It's a pieces, right? It's a pieces of this larger full network. And this, right, this is what we have, right? We don't know, we don't know, uh, we can't connect them, and uh, we don't know who they are, uh, they're really altered, but uh, we do know something about what it looks like. So these little configurations, these little pieces, that's really what Ego Network actually is. And so the question for, uh, for the rest of the session is, okay, um, what, um, what are you gonna, so if you have, uh, if this is what you're working with, you know, what, um, how is this useful, right? If this is what you have, um, what can you do with it? What can't you do with it? And um, what types of questions can we ask? Okay, and so in the, uh, uh, with the goal of trying to understand why pieces of a network uh, may be useful, um, first, try to understand a little bit about how ego network data is usually collected. Okay, so I'll say usually, um, and we'll get um, some examples throughout. But um, okay, so how is it? Um, how is it usually collected? And specifically in the context of uh, so we just saw you know, a talk on uh, Twitter data and Facebook and the like, and that's uh, very interesting and uh, certainly um, what people are doing increasingly. But you know, there's still. Uh, um, a very, very long tradition, and we still end up collecting lots of our data sort of the old-fashioned way um, with surveys, um, right? We, we interview our respondents and we ask them questions. And um, the idea here is that ego network data ends up being a very, sorry, easy, very convenient way of combining, combining aspects of traditional survey data like the GSS, like, you know, PSID, census, whatever, right? Um, with things that have the feeling of networks, right? And so we're basically going to combine aspects of traditional survey with uh, those pieces of a network. Okay, so traditional survey data, right? What are we going to get? Things like age, education, right? Does someone smoke, drink, health behavior, all the typical things you may expect, okay? So what we're going to do uh, is basically take things that look like a bus, you know, a traditional row in a data set, age, education, smoking, drinking, and the like, and we're basically going to embed within this larger survey um, something that looks network-like, okay? Of course, it's network-like uh, in the sense that it only focuses on ego, but it still has the, the feeling of a network, and it is, in fact, simply one piece of that larger full network that, we discussed, we, uh, that I showed you at the beginning, okay? And so here's the same little example. Um, with ego, we have the ties uh, from ego to the four friends, and we also have the ties between the alters. Um, and of course, you can represent this uh, as a matrix. And I imagine um, we, we've already seen how to go from that to that. Yes, yes, good, okay. So there we go, that's simply the matrix representation of this little picture. The point is, um, what ego network data does is make this, this matrix surrounding an individual um, uh, accessible via traditional surveys, which you can imagine is pretty useful if you're interested in um, trying to explain health behavior, health outcomes, because you can get things about the network properties and use them as predictors for things you may care about. Okay, and so with that, uh, with that said, um, why, why bother? Why bother with ego network data? Um, uh, and this is gonna come as no surprise to uh, many of you, uh, especially in the health sciences and social sciences and the like, um, not surprising. But what I want to, so two themes. There are basically two themes in the, uh, in, in, the, in the lecture. And the first theme is that, um, or the claim, is that ego network data provides information both at the local level, where you can use to collect information about individuals and who they're interacting with, use that as a predictor of various things. That's really at the personal or local level. Okay? And that's traditional, typical things we may do. The, the second claim, or the, the claim is that there's a analogous global or aggregate measures that we can get. And so ego network data has a, both a local, a personal um, sort of flavor about it, as well as something more global. And so we're gonna see this as we walk through some of the examples. But I want you to have this sort of in the back of your head. We think of, you know, we think of ego network data as a purely a local property. I'm gonna suggest that is a selling the data short. How's that? Um, and you'll see why uh, uh, in a second. But um, okay, so for now, um, so why, why ego network data? Uh, okay, so from uh, from ego's perspective, it's a good predictor of 
stuff that we may care about. Um, uh, health behavior and health outcomes and the like, uh, plus from personal network data, we can get information about social support, um, as well as access to resources such as um, you know, who, can you, who would lend you money and who would drive you to the hospital uh, in a crisis emergency and the like. So who, you know, who um, for both access to resources as well as uh, emotional support and things like that. There's a long literature describing how these things are related to health outcomes. There's also a long literature on the side of things, on um, uh, your personal network as creating essentially normative pressure in the sense of creating what's normal, um, sp specifically for, let's say, uh, drinking behavior or eating habits or the like, okay? And so the idea here is that you collect data on an individual who they interact with and it's something about, you know, when they interact with these people, what happens in terms of things you care about. And we'll get some more concrete examples in a second. But the idea here is that it could help you as a predictor of an individual um, outcome, right? And that's really from ego's perspective. There is a analogous, uh, so I'm gonna cut, an analogous um, measure at the global level. And so we're gonna, as we walk through what can you measure with ego network data, uh, we're going to have both a um, sort of local measure as well as the analogous measure at this system level. Okay, and so we're gonna have that as sort of an that sort of duality or that sort of dual measures as we go through. And you'll see that um, um, in a second. Question, yeah? Ah, good, yes, excellent. Okay, so um, so the idea here, um, kind of mixing between groups, um, basically a question such as, do people with uh, higher education interact with people with lower education? Okay, so mixing in a sense of the probability of interaction between uh, two groups, so we're aggregating up. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, good. So homophily is a tendency for people who are similar to interact. That's essentially a question one could ask. Is there homophily? Uh, mixing just is the base, basically table that says, okay, um, what is the rate of interaction between um, this group and that group? If there was homophily, you'd find all the interaction essentially on the diagonal, right? Uh, people less than a high school marry people less than high school and the like. So essentially homophily is a tendency, the mixing is sort of the actual data, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, or I mean, I would say homophily is, um, it becomes a question. Is there homophily, right? Um, uh, the mixing rates are from the base data itself. It is a simple description. As we'll see, um, uh, not to jump too ahead, but we will see, in fact, a mixing matrix of uh, 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 ties between sets of individuals. And so the, so good question. Um, yeah, so anytime the, the uh, terminology is unclear, uh, 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 do, wave, uh, do wave me down. But good, excellent. So that's exactly the right intuition that, um, and so the idea here is that you think about local and global. Um, the local, uh, uh, as we'll see in a second, uh, you can understand wh you know, what types of people an individual interact with. At the global level, you're interested in the rate of interaction between sets of groups. And so the level of aggregation, uh, we go up a level as we aggregate up. And so, and uh, perhaps more important for health-related outcomes, um, uh, you can use ego network data to say something about the potential for diffusion. Specifically, um, uh, uh, imagine you want to understand the risk of global epidemic for the community for uh, HIV or HCV or, or the like. Um, and so the point here is that you can use ego network data as a way of inferring what, um, what a global network looks like. This is going to be a subtle point that you'll see in a second. Uh, and you can use that to try to understand, okay, is this community at risk or not for spread of disease? On the other hand, uh, throughout the <laughs> diffusion works both ways. Not only um, can you uh, uh, be worried about HIV or HCV spread, but you can also ask, okay, if we have institute a new health practice or um, imagine uh, you're interested in drug users and you institute a, you know, a um, needle exchange program and you want to get the word out, how quickly would that happen depending on the network structure? Uh, the claim is that ego network data it offers a way of uh, inferring what that looks like. So both properties at the local level as well as the global. And we'll see what that looks like as we walk through. So uh, why else uh, use that ego network data? Uh, the sort of second theme beyond um, 
local and global, is that um, there's a, a lot more than you think. Uh, Eagle Network data ends up having a lot more information than we typically imagine it does, um, especially when you put it all together. Um, and so we're not going to walk through all of this right now. We'll walk through it um, as we uh, as we go through. But I just want to get a sense of the variety of things one you one can get even from such pieces of a full network. Okay, so what types of things can you get? Um, well, you can get things about the composition of an individual social world, like demographic and as well as shared activities and the like, as well as things about the structural features, as we'll see, as well as some about the nature of the ties. And so the, the point here is not the specifics, but um, just to give you a flavor for the idea that uh, uh, I, I, I would say we, we don't get enough out of ego network data, and there's actually Quite, quite a lot there, um, and um, uh, and, what, and so we'll go to highlight that as we as we walk through. So both the idea that ego network data has a local, so a lo good local parameter, as well as a global, as well as there's lots of data there, um, lots of information to be had from ego network data that we often uh, sort of bypass or ignore or don't quite. Um, I would say we don't quite utilize ego network data to its fullest. How is that? Um, Okay, and so a uh, summary of this, uh, cost and benefits. Um, okay, so lots of information for cheap. So, so, so the claim, uh, say the claim goes, very easy to do, be part of a traditional survey, right? So the GSF has ego network data every so, you know, I don't know, not very often, but once in a while. So it's easy to embed in a traditional survey, which is good if you're interested in, um, you know, predictor, using ego network data as a predictor of health, health outcomes. Very nice to be able to, to embed it in a traditional survey because then you have all the measures of health and health outcomes, behavioral, and what have you, uh, right there. And you can easily, of course, attach that to demographic characteristics. And now you also have predictor of something about the people they interact with, which may be very nice. Okay. So it's, it's one of the main key advantages is the ease by which you can embed it in uh, very traditional, traditional surveys. So it's actually getting network-like things, even though they're individually sampled um, individuals, which is a, a nice feature. Okay, and so these, uh, these two features here basically reiterate the idea that you're getting both uh, predictors, uh, local predictors of things you're really interested in in terms of predicting health and health outcomes, and uh, the claim, and uh, flesh this out as we go along, that um, you can use ego network data to, uh, to describe global network properties. Not, not often done, but, uh, but possible. Okay, and so using the local information to say something about the global. And so again, they claim that there's a lot more than uh, you may imagine. So the cost. Uh, so th these are the benefits. Uh, what are the costs? Well, you have to rely on self-reports of ties. Okay. So everything is relative to egos, right? egos perception of what a tie is, both with the alter characteristics and um, ties between alters. And so you're re relying on ego to report on on all these things, which. Um, I won't, uh, I won't go into uh, too much detail, but uh, there's uh, plenty of work on uh, trying to figure out uh, exactly what types of biases there are and how bad it is and things like that. And so um, something to be aware of if you are using this type of data or are interested in collecting this type of data, that um, of course you do have to rely on self-reports and there may be certain types of biases. Uh, related to that, um, egos are treated as independent, right? So, so they basically are acting as if ego is independent of all the other egos um, collected, or all the other data collected, which may make sense um, if you're collecting information on, right, the entire United States of America and you collect ego network data, it's probably fine to go into a specific school, right? Uh, the, the people you uh, collect may or may not actually be independent. And so that assumption uh, may or may not be true. And I'll say we generally emphasize the structure of the network, although they say it is possible to infer uh, something about the global features from local information, we typically don't. Why? Uh, because it's kind of hard, and um, uh, although it could be easier, and so we often, so the, the default is to, in fact, miss the larger structure uh, in lieu of focusing on just what's going on with ego. Okay, and so the local view kind of uh, forces your hand a little, although it doesn't have to, it, it tends to put you in a mind frame where um, you are focusing on purely local properties. Okay, and so for me, those are the those are the cause, uh, the potential biases, as well as the the focus on typically local properties. Okay, so um, 
Question, yes. Uh, so typically, when people actually study EO network data, it is on a national survey. Not always, but often, in which case, um, you know, the probability of two people sample knowing each other or their, even their friends knowing each other is very, 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 very small. And so typically, we ignore it um, because it is effectively, they are effectively independent, right? Um, it becomes a problem if you're going into a particular community, a particular organization, and then you're collecting ego network data, in which case two egos or you know the author's name, you know, they could be the same people, right? And so the answer is most of what we do on you know, say I'll say most uh, ends up um, being on just national or almost national data sets, in which case easy to ignore. Um, harder, harder uh, when you go into a specific organization the like in which case, uh, ego network data may or may not be the most appropriate data structure. I mean, once you're into a world where people are, you're gonna randomly sample two people and they have some non-zero probability of interacting, uh, either you know some sort of snowball sample, RDS, or you're in the world of full network data at that point. And so I would say if they really have a good chance of knowing each other, you're probably in the world of better to actually, if you can get full network data, you might as well. I don't know if that answers the question. But yeah, so in some ways, your, your, your question's a good one, but ego network data is most appropriate for cases where it's not gonna, where they are, in fact, going to be independent. That's really, in some ways, what it's built for. Okay, other questions before we get into collection and analy analyzing it and the like? Okay, very good. Um, and I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but I do want to, I do want to get into the, the R stuff. So I'm gonna go through this. Um, Fairly quickly, fairly quickly, and then um, we'll hopefully we'll have time for uh, a bit of our, our demonstration. Okay, so um, as we sort of just highlighted, uh, I'd say there are two ways of, one could, how could you get this data, right? Um, two basic ways, one, you could, you could collect full network data and, and treat them as independent, um, extract the ego network data uh, from a full network, imagine this is your full network, right? A uh, little silly example, but what have you. Um, you have six people, right, and you collect this data and you basically extract from this data um, each person's personal network, uh, in this case, you know, Alice and Beth. Uh, this is something one could do. Um, may seem strange, but there may be good reasons to do it. Um, and so the thing is want to note is that this would come from the reports of you know, the other people in that network as opposed to self-reports. So that's certainly the advantage is that in this world you have, um, you actually have the reports on the ties between, right, authors, so in this case you have Beth, Beth's name, and Carl and Diana, uh, and you can see Carl and Diana are friends and they have come from their own reports. Okay, so that's advantage in the sense that you're getting better data on, um, on the people who uh, are, are one, Beth Alice, but they're authors. Uh, but this is, I would say, atypical, right? Question? Yeah, that's, that is exactly right. That's why it's an atypical thing to do. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. Um, you could do it, uh, but you, you really wouldn't. Uh, you, you really would. If you have the full network data, you might as well analyze it as, um, uh, as the full network, right? So you have the full network data, you might as well analyze it as such. But, um, and, yeah. Just to jump in, I mean, I think that the cases where this typically happens is when people are, are interested in characteristics of alters as predictors of ego behavior. So they have the full network data, but all they really care about are the extent to which um, ego was exposed to smoking in their local neighbor, na neighborhood, for example. And I just want to count the number of smokers that ego is connected to and to use the data as if it's ego network data in that sense. Um, your cases are not independent, um, and treating them as independent is a mistake. Um, uh, whether or not it's a, a horribly biasing mistake compared to the other options, Yes. That's the reason people would do it. Um, Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that actually your network data, or is that just the counts of people that you're trying to estimate that you would do that you're looking at? It doesn't really seem to be network data at that point. No, you're absolutely, you're, you're, you're right. That's actually a very good point. For those who couldn't hear, is that network data or not? Um, like it, it, it is, in the sense that it's egos, um, uh, it's, you're getting it from 
all of his own reporters. So he emailed the reporters who their friends are. Those friends said, I smoke or not. And so you've now been counted the number of smokers in either neighborhood. It's not ego network data in that, in principle, you didn't need the identities of those people to get that information. You could have gotten it from an ego network survey the way that my guest just described and said, how many of your friends smoke? And the ego could have just reported it. And so from a, from a final variable construction standpoint, those things look exactly the same and there's no identity built in for who the smokers are or any other characteristic of the relation. Um, it's, it's an inefficient use of all that data. If, you, if fundamentally your only question is my exposure to smoking increase my own smoking, uh, then you don't need the rest of the, uh, the, the data. You don't need the identities. You would have, might have been better off collecting ego network data to start with. Um, but you, um, if you've already collected the network data, you might want to use that in interesting ways to think about the ways in which this actual extended network autocorrelation is some sense. Interestingly, this is what the Framingham study does, right? The Framingham study does, all the Framingham studies, the Sackler and Fowler studies, use global network data from the Framingham study as if it's ego network data when they're looking at alters from changing BMI for egos changing BMI. Um, so for most about half of their models are effectively ego network data models. Um, some of their three-step uh, separation stuff, that's a different model, but um, that's, that's the reason that it's used. Um. Yeah, so I'll add that um, if you are in the world of using full network data and uh, are interested in the alter characteristics as predictors, you probably do want to some to run some sort of spatial autocorrelation model because you do have, you do know who they're interacting with and of course they're not actually independent. You have that data. So it is possible to, to adjust for the fact that you know uh, who is interacting with whom. And so, yes. Uh, so they're literally Repeat models the for, oh yeah, so the, um, the point is if you do have you know, full network data, and you are analyzing them as uh, ego networks, you, you can adjust for the dependence between cases uh, using uh, spatial autocorrelation models, which are uh, basically, you know, linear models that have terms for, imagine putting in a, uh, in the error term, um, basically a weight matrix that says who's interacting with whom. So I'm not gonna go into detail, but the point is there are ways of um, adjusting for the dependence between cases. So it is possible. Yes, okay, no, no, that's okay. Uh, no, this is a whole class of models. We'll chat afterwards. How's that? Yes. Okay. So we'll also go over both of those models on my interior flow chat. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so more typical is to actually collect uh, independently sampled ego network data. So this is not you're going into a school and. Um, and uh, collecting up the full data, but instead you're uh, randomly, this is a, like your traditional survey, you're randomly sampling individuals. Um, they are in fact a, a random sample, and you're asking beginning a traditional survey questions, age, education, health, uh, smoking, and the like, uh, and then you're also asking um, uh, something about uh, who they're interacting with, uh, specifically uh, to naming their alters, their alter characteristics, as well as the ties uh, between alters. And I'll go through this uh, pretty, pretty quickly, it's fairly, fairly straightforward, but um, okay, so what are you going to do? Um, again, right now we're thinking of these as uh, GSS-like data, right? You're going to randomly sample individuals, um, and you're going to add, uh, uh, on top of the normal questions you'd ask, something about the people they're interacting with, okay? And so um, step one is to basically have them uh, uh, name the people that they, uh, um, for a list of contacts, and I'll give you an example of uh, questions in a second. Um, the key characteristics, uh, things to think about. First, uh, you know, as um, it's important, you don't need the names or the IDs, which Jim mentioned earlier. This is quite useful, of course, um, when you're trying to get uh, information on drug users or um, sexual partners, which, of course, uh, is quite, quite good. You don't need a specific ID. You don't need actual names. It can be nicknames um, and the like. Uh, it's best, okay, it's best not to um, limit the number of people they can name, although it, it most data often does. Um, it is best not to. And the last, the last question, um, good idea to ask multiple questions. Um, both for uh, data quality reasons, um, good, you know, one question may be interpreted in multiple ways, but also the fact that um, someone who you're close friends with may not be someone who you actually uh, ask for health advice. And so you may just go to different people for different things. And so by asking multiple questions, you're getting a fuller picture of someone's uh, personal network. And so, sort of general advice, uh, 
uh, you know, don't don't limit the number of people that can maybe that's a problem. And uh, more questions is generally generally better. Okay, so examples. Um, so I have these are just a, a couple. Uh, there are of course more one could do. So the first one is literally from from the GSS, right? Uh, uh, looking back over the last six months, who are the people with whom we discussed is currently with personal matters. Uh, there are lots of other general name generators like who your friends are, who you're close to, things like that. Uh, but of course, you can also ask more specific things: um, who you sucked with the last six months, who you shot up with, and the like. Which of course has more direct health implications. Um, if you're interested in uh, sexual partners or uh, drug use partners, and then of course you can also do social support. And so you get a sense of the flexibility, right? A sense of the flexibility of the types of questions you could ask. Um, and so for social support, you could ask, okay, um, who are sick? Who would be willing to drive to the hospital? Uh, who do you go to for advice? Um, and the like. And so you know, what question to ask? Obviously, uh, there's no single answer. Uh, it depends uh, what your question is, right? It depends on what your question is. Right? And so um, you know, if you're interested in uh, disease spread through uh, a rural community, uh, drug users, uh, perhaps you should ask about uh, drug use. Uh, or just for example, I don't know. OK, so. Uh, step two, so we have something, we've, we've asked them, you know, uh, to, to enumerate a list of people that they um, are friends with or uh, discuss important matters with or who they go to for advice or what have you. Um, we could have asked multiple questions, unclear. Let's imagine that we asked one question for now. Uh, step two in getting the data would be to um, very simply ask something to ask the respondent, right? This is all about using the respondent's reports um, on the named alters to ask to to then ask the respondent to describe characteristics of the named alters. So age, education, gender, and the like, as well as something about um, the nature of the relationship and the typical things you may get. Um, this is, uh, imagine you get this in the GSS, like, like data, frequency of contact, uh, whether they're kin or not. This is uh, often important in terms of you know, health and social support, as well as how close they are and how long they've known each other. And so what is the data gonna look like? Well, when we throw it into R, um, this is a typical data structure, um, right? So this is our, our one row, our respondent. We have uh, this age and education. This is, uh, this is a 40-year-old with 15 years of education. This is our respondent. And so the rest of it is the information about the named alters, okay? And so we have, just imagine they name two people that they go to for health advice, uh, alter one, alter two, and we ask them about age and education. And so the first alter is 38. Uh, 15 years of education, second alter is 35, 12 years of education, and the like. You can see it's sort of named in a systematic way, alter one, alter two, alter one, alter two, and the like. Question? Yes. Yeah. Um, when you asked uh, the ego mm -hmm. about the age of the alter, sometimes we don't know who's yeah. exact age. Sure. So typically, do you ask for range, or do you ask them to give an estimate of the age? How do you ask them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so two questions, two, two, two responses. Uh, so first, it varies by survey. Um, so there's not like, this is the way to do it, uh, unfortunate. Um, usually the way the wording goes, they say something like, to the best of your knowledge, how old do you think they are? And then they'll you know, write it down. Of course, the person could say, I have no idea. Or you know, they could say they don't know. Or you could, of course, do bins. <coughs> that would also make sense. 30 to 35, you know, I don't quite know how old my uncle is, but he's somewhere, you know, he's, he's 38 or what have you. But um, so I wouldn't say there's a, this has to be the way to do it, but that's t typical would be to, to, to allow for the fact that they may not know. And I, I would say bins make sense, um, especially for things that are, I mean, I don't know exactly how old someone is, but you have a, some sense. Um, the second response to that is, uh, you know, uh, you're right. So the ego may not know everything about the alters. And so you gotta be a little careful about what is plausible to ask. Age and education, yeah, probably. Um, gender, okay. Race, ethnicity, harder, perhaps. Um, unless you get into, you know, political ideology and, you know, specific things like that, harder. And so you need to be careful. <laughs> careful of what you can ask and careful what you can get out of it. So yes, very good question. Yeah. Maybe still no, 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 that's good. If there's no real name, no ID, no s uh, for sure um, any information, then how do you match the uh, alter? Like, do you, do you have the uh, network? No. So, when, you know, uh, so okay, so, so good. So, so good. So for ego network data, there 
there is no matching. You're just you're saying, okay, um, so who do you go to for advice? And then let's I say, say Mary. Okay, and, and then, then, then she said Mary too, but maybe two different Mary. So but that doesn't matter because you would say, okay, for matter. for that altar, um, tell me their age. And you would say, Mary, I think Mary is 38. Okay, and then you would say, okay, for Mary, um, what's the level of education? And she would say, you would say she's 16. And then you would basically enumerate four. So it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't need to be a specific person, right? So in the sense that you're never going to have that Mary in the data set. You're just going to get the characteristics about the person you know. So we never, you know, as the, as the researcher, I never see the Mary we name. We don't go and interview her, and we're never gonna find her. We're just gonna have a little bit of information about her from your report about her. Does that make sense? Because that's your concern. Yes. Okay. <laughs> because then how would I know this Mary uh, has relationship with Jim Olsen? You would know that. You, you wouldn't know that, exactly. That's, that's the cost of the Ego Network data. So the fundamental cost of Ego Network data is we have no way, usually, to match the alters across the respondents. So if Jeff, if Jeff's name's Jill as a friend, and I name Jill as a friend, I don't know they're the same person. Yeah, that's quite different. I mean, uh, I don't know what they're the same person. Yeah. I mean, it's just something like that. Yeah. If you think about the <laughs> yeah. So. You, you can't capture the, the problem is is that you, there's n choose degree possible networks. So you yeah. can't you can't enumerate all possible networks. You can sample from that network space using random graph models. And so if we know the class of all models of with this degree distribution, we can then sample from that and generate a probability distribution of mo of networks for which the sample of ego networks we drew would fit. And so that's which is not exactly the same as enumerating all possible. Right, so we, we, will, we will chat about, uh, if, if we get time, I don't know, um, about the possibilities of taking information from the Ego network data and trying to infer what the global network looks like. That's still different than knowing whether a specific person is tied to a specific other person outside the Ego network, which you simply just do not know for sure. So that's the key. You really don't know that for sure. That's the, 
that is the cost of the exam that we gave it. If it only grew, you know, your respondent maybe some of the types of payments. That's it. So everything else is unknown. Yes? Okay. Good. So what else would you get? Uh, you'd also get some information about, say, how, how long they've known each other or, you know, something about um, how often they interact and the like. Okay, so here, here is where we get the information um, about the ties between alters. Um, so you would ask for each pair, okay, um, whether or not uh, alter one uh, and alter two are, do they know each other or are they strangers? Just by example from the DSS. There are, of course, other ways you could do this, but the point is you're having the respondent, right, uh, again, name their alter, but then go to say, okay, for each pair, um, whether or not uh, Alter one and alter two know each other. Are they close? Are they just friends? And the like. And so again, this is from the point of view of the respondent reporting, right? So we can, uh, uh, you know, question whether the validity of these reports, but they all report on whether those two alters are tied or not. We don't actually go out and interview, typically. So typically, you do not actually go out and interview alter one, alter two to see if this is true, but then we use the reports as, 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 as a proxy, okay? And so again, we're not gonna go outside the EU network, and even the ties within the EU network that don't involve ego are based on reports of our ego assessment on, uh, based on each pair. Okay, so in this case, we have you know, two alters. We know something about them, their characteristics, age, and education, how, you know, how often do they see each other. This is the point of view from ego. And this last column, right, this last column captures um, whether or not these two named alters, alter one, alter two, um, whether or not they know each other and something about how close it is, okay? And so this is, um, you know, what's the point of this? Uh, this is a typical data structure, right? So this is kind of what it's going to look like. Uh, you collect ego network data, or you download ego network data, it's already collected, you throw it into R, and this is typically what you're gonna be working with. Um, so it's going to have something about ego's characteristics, something about alter's characteristics, something about their ties, and then a string of columns um, uh, for each alter pair. So if there were no alters, one to two, one to three, and then two to three. So for each alter, alter pair, um, you say whether or not there's a tie or not. Okay, and so that is what the data is going to, going to look like. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, let me, how much time I have. Okay, so, so far, so far, what do we know? Uh, so far we should know a little bit about uh, what the data looks like uh, through some Good questions, um, as well as a little bit about you know why why this may be a useful thing to do. Uh, let me quickly go over how to take data that looks like this, right, and analyze it. What types of things can one uh, actually uh, actually do with this type of data? And then uh, we'll go through a hopefully a short, <laughs> that'll be a fairly short uh, R demonstration. But that's uh, I think that's okay. Okay, so um, analyzing it, and then. As I, as I hinted at, I want to both describe both the local properties, okay, so things that you would typically use as predictors of health outcomes and health behaviors and the like. Um, this is a sort of traditional, typical thing to do, as well as, as with the local measures, as well as, uh, as that has turned green, uh, okay, I don't know, ah, there we go, okay, good. Uh, okay, so, um, and the um, and the so both the local measures, which is a typical, as well as um, what type of aggregate or global measures about the Delta network you can actually get from even from this local local data. Okay, and so as I say here, the typical thing to do, and this is where we will start, is to take properties of ego networks, uh, measure them, and then use them as a predictor of uh, uh, health, mental health, behavioral outcomes. So what uh, what types of things you know can we measure uh, from very simple to slightly uh, less simple to other very simple things we can do is to count up uh, the number of named alters. Right. So our ego is our white node in the middle, and the blue nodes are our alters. Uh, very simple, right? We can uh, count them up to see. Look, wonderful. Four four people named. Uh, very good. Uh, here six. Excellent. This is right from the data, right? How many people did they name? Um, good, so why, you know, why, why bother this? Well, it ends up being a uh, pretty good, pretty good predictor of lots of things we may care about. 
Um, so for example, uh, you know, if you wanted to predict, um, you know, health outcomes or resiliency to disease and the like, um, or illness, um, you know, the number of people you could go to for social support ends up being a very good predictor of uh, good health outcomes. It may not come as a surprise, but it's a good predictor. And so if you're measuring health and doing network stuff, that's often the place that you will start, okay? Um, of course, it's not always good, right? You could, you could be bad, right? Or bad in terms of health behaviors. Uh, if you, um, if you're thinking kind of about drug partners, right? Then um, having more drug, larger network of drug partners is, uh, you know, puts perhaps predictive of future risky behavior, which would be uh, 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 not a good health outcome. Uh, and so that's the local level, right? Now the predictor of things we may care about. Um, but there's also the analogous, the analogous, which is sort of the hint of that, the analogous measure at the global level by aggregating up over each case. So here we're using it as a predictor of individual outcomes. Here you're aggregating up. So if you aggregate over all, in, all, you know, everyone's network size, you get a estimate. It's a sample, right? But it's still an estimate of the degree distribution for that particular network. Okay. And so the idea here is that while the information we're getting about each individual, you are in fact uh, getting information about the global network, in this case, the degree distribution, all right? And so here's an example of one from uh, female sex workers in China on friendships, uh, a long tail, <coughs> and the like. And so this is important as it is a important uh, in terms of structuring global network properties. And so already we get to see that our ego network data offers perhaps uh, uh, not so obvious information, both at the local and global levels. So second, composition. And here we get into mixing between groups as well as um, homophily and, and things of this nature. Um, okay, and so composition. So first we've done size. Composition is, <coughs> tells us something about the characteristics of the named alters. So typical things to study, um, demographics. So much of my own work is on this. Uh, but we can also, of course, be interested in types of people. So kin versus non-kin could be important for social support as well as resources and risk. And so I'm going to describe the measures in terms of demographic characteristics, and then I'm going to sort of circle around at the end uh, and discuss how the measures we did on demographics could be related um, fairly straightforwardly to uh, questions of health. Good. So, good. Um, so demographics. Uh, as we uh, hinted at perhaps uh, earlier, uh, um, when we're interested in uh, demographic characteristics, general tendency tends to be homophily, okay? Um, and so what does that mean? Uh, homophily in the sense that people tend to interact with people who are similar than themselves. And so what types of questions could we ask? Uh, well, we could ask at the local level, so from an individual's point of view, how diverse or homogenous is my social world? Uh, am I surrounded by people who are very similar to me or not? Um, how diverse is the people, is, is the, are the individuals I interact with? That's from the ego's point of view. There is the analogous measure at the more global or aggregate level. Is there lots of contact between different demographic groups? And so examples, a couple examples of that, and then we'll get into, okay, how would you measure this, right? How would you actually measure this? Uh, okay, so uh, examples on the, from the ego's point of view, well, we could ask things like, okay, I collected my data, uh, I named my alters, I reported on their gender and their race, ethnicity, and education, age, and these types of things. What could I ask? Well, I could ask, okay, what proportion of uh, Ego's friends are, are white, are female, are um, a different gender than themselves, and the like. And so we'll get into both of those types of measures in a second. Um, there's also the sort of analogous measure at um, the global level, you know, what proportion of ties are between uh, within racial groups? Um, is there, you know, are there marriages between um, uh, different racial ethnic groups? Is there a wrong literature, of course, in, in, in sociology? Um, okay, so I'm going to start with the local. Uh, this is based on, uh, from ego's point of view, and we're basically going to compare ego to alter and say, okay, uh, how similar is ego in terms of some characteristic of interest uh, to their named alter, right? And again, these are based on purely on reports of ego to, to uh, <coughs> on each alter, all right? So two simple measures, you know, I don't need to, I'm not gonna belabor the, the measurement, it's fairly straightforward. But um, one, uh, proportion homophilous, so given the, um, 
uh, the name alters, multiple portion are the same as, um, as ego. Okay, so basically you can compare ego to alter on each characteristic, or each um, characteristic of interest, and say multiple portion to multiple work. And I'll just show you an example in a second. Um, and the other would be this EI index, uh, which is basically just a different weighting scheme of the same thing. And so we have E, which is like number of ties to different groups, I, the number of ties to the same group, and we basically then just have negative one to one, where negative one says uh, ego is the same as all, each alter is the same as ego on M1, where um, so zero is with basically 50 50. So let me show you a um, little example to make it uh, perhaps clearer. Okay, and so we have two, two example ego networks, uh, obviously. Uh, so ego is in the middle, right? They're tied to everybody. And this is, um, let's say this is gender blue and pink for, you know, for the sake of simplicity. Top one, obviously, purely homogenous. Ego is the same as all the alters. And so if you, you know, actually calculate these measures, um, we get a negative one with this EI index, which says it's purely homophilous. Ego is the same as alter for all the alters. And of course, if you um, measure the portion, say, uh, we get out of the total possible four alters, ego is the same, 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 same. And so portion is the same as one. It just says that ego is the same as all the people that they named. Very simple, um, but also a very, uh, very simple, very good measure of um, whether or not they're the same or not. And here's a, of course, a very kind of simple example of sort of 50 50, right? So ignoring, so you compare ego to alter, right? Obviously, it's the same as half of the all named alters. And so if you measure it in terms of proportional homophilus, it's half, which is not too surprising. Uh, when you do the EI index, right, it's zero as you have, um, uh, you're comparing the number of in-group to out-group. So you say so the number of out-group minus number of in-group, and that equals zero, and so they're the same, which tells you it's zero. So these are different, different weighting, different measures of the same thing, trying to capture how similar is ego to alter. Okay, fairly straightforward. Um, the sort of second, slightly different version of this um, is uh, looking at not not how similar ego is to alter, but um, instead how diverse all the alters. So you, here you completely ignore the alters. Um, okay, sorry, so completely ignore ego. You just ask, okay, um, how similar are all the alters to each other? How diverse are the alters? And we may have some sense that diversity of social support or job contacts or the like uh, could be advantageous. And so I won't walk through the measure, but there are lots of possibilities. One is this uh, IQV. This is from Peter Blau years ago, um, uh, ranging from um, zero to one, where you know zero is all in one category and one is evenly um, distributed. So basically a measure of how evenly distributed in terms of, let's say, gender or education, are the alters. Okay, and so the point here is that two different versions, the specifics are less important than the idea that this is comparing ego to alter, and this is only looking at the diversity of the alters, ignoring the characteristic of ego. Okay. Okay. So, um, so why, you know, why measure, um, you know, why why worry with, uh, uh, how is this useful for? Um, for health, right? So this gave you some measure of how similar ego is to alter. Um, this gave you some measure of the diversity of the alters themselves. Um, why, you know, what does this have to do with uh, health? Um, well, I'll give you three, three basic uh, examples. So first, um, the idea that um, it could be a measure of risk, okay? So in the sense of knowing, you know, what proportion of your alters are also drug users or even known drug users, so let's say a risk, right? Um, on the other hand, of course, you could also be a good thing if you're very stuck in terms of resources, but proportion you can proportion with higher income or education, that uh, could be seen as a resource. And then finally, it could also be a stress hit, <laughs> right? So the proportion of people in your personal network that have chronic illnesses or that you end up having to take care of and the like, of course, that is a potential stressor. So what's the point here is that you know, we tend to we tend to think of ego network data when we uh, use it as a predictor, as um, as a second one, right? As as a resource, it's good, right? More is good, uh, more kin is good, or something like that. Um, I want just to highlight that it's a you know, 
these are very general sets of data, and we're getting lots of things, not just the resources, but in fact, both the risks one faced as well as the threat one. And this is all can be got from basically the same, the same data structure. Okay, so a variety of pieces of information from the same basic, uh, same basic uh, uh, piece of data. Okay, so, so that's the local, right? So these are, this is information about, about uh, from Ego's point of view in terms of who they're interacting with. Um, and so there are clear health implications. There are um, both, there are also a global implication. So this is where we, we discussed earlier about mixing patterns between groups. Um, so this is from Ego's point of view, how similar or different is Ego from the alters and how diverse all the alters themselves. This aggregate up, not from Ego's point of view, but from the sort of system level, how many ties are there between different types of groups? So this is an example from uh, female sex workers in China, looking at the ties, the friendship ties, of who do you know across here, right? And we see that in fact, um, there is strong in-group bias that people in so tier defined by sort of what type of venue you worked at. And so the idea here is that um, people in low tier venues tend to be friends with low tier, maybe middle, uh, middle tier tend to be friends with middle, and high tier end up uh, interacting with these people up here. So what's the point? Is that in terms of a health point of view, if you were trying to get an intervention, um, you would have to basically hit each tier separately as there's not that much contact um, between them. Okay. And so the, uh, the idea here that this ends up being an aggregation of the types of information that we tend to get from local ego network data. And uh, I'll, skip, uh, I'll skip that. Okay. So, um, so far, we've gotten a little sense of the data. Okay. We've gotten a little sense of the you know, network size is pretty easy to measure. We can measure composition in different ways. Um, the last thing we can measure uh, in terms of the, the local properties, something about the structure of the ego network. Um, and so this ends up combining information about those alter and alter ties, right? So we saw that data structure at the beginning, um, both naming the alters as well as their characteristics and the ties between alters. So we're going to take that information. We're going to take information about that as well as the size, and we're going to say something about the structure of that crystal network. Again, we're not going to go, we're not going to go beyond <laughs> egos. No, we're not going to go two, two steps out. We're only going to uh, look at what's going on with ego and the people it's interacting with, but within that little world, what does it look like? And so why do we care? Well, um, you know, one simple reason is that norms are easier <coughs> to maintain uh, if there's in fact a, a stronger social closure, which makes sense, happens in certain types of environments, specifically one where um, everyone knows everybody else. And we'll see an example of that uh, in a second. Okay, so what type of structural measures can we do? Well, the very simplest, the very simplest is uh, uh, and so density is just like normal density measure. Um, I assume we've seen this before, yes, density. Okay, so density is normal density measure. The only thing that changes from uh, what we've seen before is that we're going to ignore ego. We're going to ignore ego and all the ties from ego to alter. So you're going to start here, and you're basically going to calculate density on this. So this is an ego network. There's four people, right? Ego is tied to each alter. These two alters are tied together. When you actually calculate density, you're going to ignore, right? So ignore all the all the ties from ego to alters as those are definitional, right? Of course, ego has to be called alter. That's how you constructed the data. And so all you're left with, right? So we're going to ignore this, right? All, all you're left with is this. Right? So this DDT captures the pattern of ties between alters. Okay, and so as a simple measure, uh, one thing we could do is capture the, uh, the density, just the, the, uh, the number of actual observed ties amongst alters divided by the total possible. And we can see that that the total possible, assuming it was some directed, which we sort of have to do in the world of ego networks. Okay, and so basic idea here is pretty simple. Um, same as usual in terms of density, but we're going to ignore all the ties from ego to each alter. So why may we care? Um, well, the, uh, the reason why we may care is that um, it ends up really being important um, in terms of normative pressure and in terms of outcomes that you want to care about. This is an example from Dan Hayes' work on delinquency, but you can imagine an uh, analogous thing for um, eating behavior or other health outcomes. So on the x-axis, we have friends delinquency, y-axis, we have uh, respondents delinquency. We're interested in uh, 
Nico is just delinquency, um, and maybe that's not surprising. Uh, the trend rate actually goes up. We have some increase in terms of the delinquency of the respondents, but um, this is this rate of increase is obviously much much stronger, much much higher um, in the world. And again, I'm starting green. Uh, there we go. Um, it's obviously much the rate of increase in terms of how much uh, the you know uh, my delinquency goes up as my friend's delinquency goes up in a world where all my friends know each other. Right? So where density is really high, um, the behavior of my friends matters a lot more. And so this is uh, some some you know, evidence that uh, uh, having stronger social control or stronger stronger normative pressure is important, and this is going to be proxied by the density of local networks. Okay? And so it matters. Um, if you care about things like your influence and the like, which we will cover uh, apparently next edit, Thursday or whatever. I'm not sure the schedule is, but uh, soon enough, soon enough. Okay, so it matters, and this is one simple way of getting it. Okay, um, I'm not gonna talk about structural holes, but uh, it exists, and if you are interested, it's, uh, uh, you can go uh, you know, look up Rombert. Uh, uh, yeah, so imagine, uh, so basically the, the idea is that uh, this may be advantageous for certain things, I'll leave it to you to look that up. Okay, good. Look at that. It exists. Ah, excellent. And not to my own work. No, uh, no. no. I, I'll just throw this out as um, I'll talk about it very quickly and I'll move on. Now, we talked about density um, as a very simple measure. Okay? I just want to highlight that there are alternative, alternative ways of measuring structure of ego networks. This is from my own work. Uh, the idea is that you can just capture and the number of ties between alters, we can also capture all the types of patterns of ties. Um, and so why is this important? Well, it ends up turning out that, um, so this is all possible configurations of alter, of ego network structures with more ego of size um, five, uh, with different number of ties between alters on the rows. And so the idea here is that all of these configurations here have the same number of ties, the same density, patterns are really different. Okay, and so the point is that um, density is a pretty good proxy for lots of stuff, it ends up not being um, quite sufficient to differentiate what look, may look like pretty different patterns of interaction um, from an ego's point of view. Sure. Um, yes? Would you consider this table sort of like the, um, the, triad, the triad census figure except for ego networks? Are you, you're looking at all these different um, forms of structure and then Yeah, that, that's good. Um, I, I would say you could think of it like that, especially if you're going to think about how the global network properties are a function of the distribution uh -huh. of these types of configurations. So yeah, sure. very good, excellent segue. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can think about, of course, the distribution of these things in a network, and these distributions end up highly structuring what the full network looks like. Mm -hmm. Exactly the right intuition. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't want to go into it, but I will say that this is a, an alternative way measuring ego network structures, and I would say um, not done very often, but it, uh, it perhaps should be, I don't know. But, uh, so if you're interested, let, let me know. Okay, uh, and I'll highlight this, uh, I just wanna hint, I wanna hint at what's possible uh, uh, with what, what's been said so far. And then I do want to at least get into R, and we won't get very far, but that's okay. Um, okay, so, so far, what have we done? We have some sense of the data, we have, um, some sense of what you can do with it. Pretty simple measures, frankly, right? Density, proportion homophilus, right? We're not even taking account the random mixing or anything like that. Um, pretty simple measures, um, but this is typically what we, you know, much of the literature does. You, you know, calculates these things and use it as a predictor of um, mental health, health outcomes, behavioral things, and the like. And that's, that's good. Um, the second sort of version of what we do is uh, looking at uh, I won't bother going back. Looking at group mixing and things like that um, as a measure of homophily and all the big divisions between racial groups and the like. The sort of third thing we can do um, from ego network data, so not simply use it as a predictor of health, health outcomes, and not simply look at you know, mixing between groups or degree distribution. The last thing um, is, to, is to utilize this information that we're getting, um, getting ego network data, measuring those things we just talked about, right? So we talked about degree distribution, 
we talked about mixing between groups. Uh, I just hinted at the three unit network configuration distribution. But the point is, we can take the unit network data, uh, capture um, all these things that we just talked about, and we can use that, the client, uh, use that to make inference about what the true network actually looks like. Okay? And so this is a, this is a world where you know, we're not really thinking about the entire United States of America, but imagine we went into um, one community, one rural community in Nebraska, you know, just, just, for, just for example, um, and you interview some handful of people, random samples of individuals, and you use that information to basically make inference about what that network looks like in that community. Okay, and so the idea is to take information we can collect and basically generate <coughs> full networks that are consistent with the information that we saw, same information in each of our networks, and we're going to use, as can be already hinted at, exponential random graph models, which we will get to uh, uh, on Thursday. More on this on Thursday. Yes, question? Sorry. Yeah, it's great. Um, Okay, yes, I agree, me too. Yes. We'll see, depends on the question. Okay, so what I'll say is that when you do this, right, you, you don't know whether two specific people are connected, right? But you can, and so the, the claim goes, you can make um, inference about what the properties of the entire network look like. So things that we may care about, such as distance and cohesion and things like that, the global network properties, you can make inference about by generating networks, this is the claim, uh, that are consistent with the information uh, in the local, it, just from ego network data. Mr. Zahal, yes, go ahead. The, 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 the intuition here, I think that might help, is you can imagine that each ego network is just like sampling from a randomly with displacement from a distribution. It just so happens that instead of being a, a unidimensional distribution like a mean, it's a, a multi-dimensional distribution that you're sampling with displacement from in your ego network. And so the, the trick is So let me, let me just highlight, yeah, yeah the, the key there is that this works, right? This works if the full network uh, is strongly structured by the information you get from the ego network. Th so the things you get tend to be, uh, so the distribution mixed between groups, ego network configuration distribution, these types of things, 
the so the the claim at the beginning that you get more information than you think out of your network data is now crucial because uh, it ends up being the case that if um, the full network data, the full network is basically a function of these things, then the full network that you generate based on that is going to look pretty good. And so the strong, the more strongly that the full network is constrained by the thing that you give to the user network, <coughs> the better the you can make inference. And so that you can only you, know, you can only generate networks that are based on the information you have. You don't have anything else. But if that ends up being a good model, then uh, ends up being a good thing. Yeah. Well, see, so you don't know. Yes, that's true. Yes. Question. So, so after your yes. earlier work, did you define which method you think is more lively to compute from either method? So which global method you compute more lively to compute from either that method? So like, for instance, um, yeah, OK, great. Yeah, right. so the. Uh, Answer well, component size and bicomponent size fairly fairly easy. Uh, distance reachability harder, but sort of possible. Also depends on how uh, how good you need this to be. If it needs to be super perfect, um, right. harder. But uh, certainly, you know, either easy. Um, component size and bicomponent size pretty good. Uh, once you get into more and more specific things, uh, harder and harder. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. So how much does your ability to retrieve these properties depend on? <laughs> so like schools yeah. have a pretty fairly strong boundary yeah. and so therefore I can imagine you know, that this would be repeated again and again across different schools and I, I you know assume yeah. that they think that's pretty reliable. But in a in a space where the boundary mm -hmm. and that the school's boundary is meaningful on behavior, therefore sure. meaningful on the network generation process, where in other cases you have a less bounded Yeah, that would be a great question. I'd say you can have the same problems if you're interested in collecting full network data in a traditional yeah. manner. Yeah. Uh, then you're in the world of perhaps needing some sort of RDS chain that's going to kind of explore the things outside the bounds. And there's a lot of work, increasingly a lot of work, trying to combine you know, ego network data of RDS things to get sort of farther out. We don't have, we don't know where the bounds are. There aren't meaningful bounds. Um, so I think that's, I think this is where this is partly where we're going. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, I, I think it, 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 weird sort of way, my, my intuition is actually is that this approach is less subject to specific sort of geographic or organizational boundary constraints and more subject to sort of relational or type boundary constraints, right? And so if it's the case that we have a good random sample from even a highly dimensional sort of underlying object we're trying to sample from, so long as we sample the relevant elements, we can get across huge variability. Um, but if, we, if there's some elements or structure in the network that we have no you know, these days sort of limit ourselves to schools, we can think about what are what do adolescent friendship networks look like? And we can ask school as a mixing teacher, right? And we're not we're not constrained to that kind of boundary in the same way we are otherwise. Yeah. It is much, much easier. And, even, and in fact, the reason that ego networks work so well for the pure influence set is the classic three pin pure influence model. When you work out the algebra, the, the term you're adding to the model is the, is the weighted mean of your friend's behavior on Y. And so, because that, uh, if you assume equilibrium on a static network, which is a big assumption, but if you make that assumption, the only information you need is the mean of ego's alters on his behavior. And so, you don't need to know anything about the structure. So now if you assume a smarter model, right, with a different kind of production, you might have a different production function on altered behavior, but it's still a function that you can write down. And that becomes a much, you're exactly right, a much simpler problem. You might have all the information about the ego alter, Right. And you don't have data on that. So now you just have to propagate the child to the alter. Right. And, and what you know from, the, from ego to alters is the likelihood that we know that distribution of alters in 
you know from ego the likelihood of a within race or a between race tie, we're willing to assume that alter two step ties are drawn from the same distribution of ego to alter ties, then we can assume the same probability and we can figure out what that matrix looks like. Exactly. So let me let me add to that that there is now I would say pretty user friendly functionality of just uh, estimating uh, exponential random graph models on <coughs> ego networks. So if you wanted to estimate the probability of a tie between people with different levels of education or different health behaviors just from the ego network data uh, is now uh, much more plausible to do that. So just what you're talking about is actually much easier than it was like four months ago or something, which would have been <laughs> useful when I was writing all this code like a year ago. <laughs> you know, uh, that's how it goes. But yeah, so you're exactly right. And it is much easier than trying to infer the full network. Um, uh, so part of the tension here is there's lots of things one could do with ego network data. You kind of have to decide uh, what it is that you are, are crucially interested in. But yes, excellent. Question? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, so we, we were probably. Sorry, it's in here. I think the Cabal. Pavel, yeah. Pavel, yeah. Oh, sorry. I always say things wrong in my meeting and don't. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a really good tutorial. We will not have time to do that on Thursday, but if you are interested in doing it, I will certainly help you find the tutorial. It's, it's a very nice tutorial on how to estimate ergums, which we haven't talked about, uh, on data, which we just have talked about. But uh, So that is of interest. Do let me know. But uh, we will probably not have time. Yes, question? Yes, OK. So uh, let me. Let me quickly wrap up and then just give a very short R tutorial. Uh, we don't have much time, but let me just give you, I'll give you a sense of kind of what the data looks like and um, how you would organize it. We won't get into much in, the, in terms of analysis, but that's okay. Uh, this is actually from a uh, paper of Giovanna, and he just shows the data. Why would you want to do this? Why would you want to try to infer uh, or estimate or simulate uh, networks from ego network data? Well, one reason is you would be interested in uh, spread of HIV or HCV through a population. Um, you can't get the full network. The best you can do is ego network data. And so one version of this is to take information on drug users or uh, contact, you know, sexual conduct between your respondents and uh, do the best you can in terms of inferring what the full network features look like, in which case you can ask hypothetical questions about the potential epidemic in a particular population. Um, and so there are clear health implications for doing this. Um, and so it's not just a, a, a you know intellectual exercise, but uh, I, in fact, are quite important. And it's an increasingly common thing that uh, network folks are are doing. And so moving forward, this is certainly one reason why you'd want ego network data in order to get something about the epidemic potential, HIV, HCV, et cetera, in your population of interest. Okay, so let me let me wrap up, and then um, we'll get into ours because. Uh, uh, I think it would be useful just to give you a sense of what the data looks like. So, and then I'll, well, first I'll save your questions and then um, we'll get into R. Okay, so uh, summary. Uh, so easy to collect, um, lots of different potential uses as we've seen. The questions kind of imply uh, you know, what you want to do may be different depending on who you are and what your questions are. Um, so typical use is you know, a measure of social support and then going to predict individual outcome. I've been doing that for many years, so it's a typical use, but not of course the only thing you can do looking at a good measure of uh, both normative behavior of the people you interact with and the like. And then what we just talked about, um, the idea that perhaps not only can you use this as a uh, predictor of you know, uh, a measure of resources and risk and things like that, but uh, also as a way of saying something about what the full network looks like, which just hinted at that uh, this in fact could be uh, useful for trying to infer or say something about the uh, global epidemic risk uh, of a population. And so when you can't you know, collect the full network of uh, uh, sexual contact or drug use in a population, which is pretty common, this is um, a, perhaps the only uh, alternative to collect ego network data and then to try to infer what the full network <coughs> looks like based on that. So, so so what's the um, sort of take home message is that ego network data more flexible than you may think, uh, more information than you may think, and um, uh, uh, both uh, um, outcomes and uh, types of analysis at the local as well as the global level. Okay, so let me pause there and then um,
you have any questions, and then we'll get into a very short art tutorial just to give you a sense of what it looks like, and um, then we'll go from there. So let me pause um, before I sort out the uh, thing again. Um, so questions before we get into um, before we get into R. You know, we've had a lot of them, and it's been it's been great actually. Yeah. Ah. A density of zero or one. And as you add alters, you get a larger variability. But working in a linear model without that variability, you can't really accurately estimate anything. Yes, so good. I, so in the work that I've been doing, I usually limit the minimum number of alters okay. to three, three, or three to five to the five maximum. Um, but with this, how would you recommend working as far as like Doing modeling, especially with the lower numbers, uh, or lower number of alters. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so the the problem here is with these people who have effectively were size, and uh, as you can see, as we go, uh, as we need more alters, the number of possible configurations just you know <laughs> increases increases non-linearly, and so you're sort of fishing in this territory, you know, where so this ignores ego. So the person needs one alter. Obviously, there's no possible density, uh, or you know, obviously all pi exist. Even if they name two, the only possibility is zero or one. There's no sort of, there's nothing kind of uh, in between, and so size ends up being, uh, you know, um, basically describing the whole thing. Um, in terms of, so you basically are throwing those folks out. So are you, are you just using density as like a predictor? Yeah. About, so size? So in addition to size. So okay. Yeah. How big's your sample? Uh, 17 inches. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that the simplest solution is to add indicator variables for the for each configuration below three. Um, so we have, and then you can test whether or not um, uh, there's a difference between configuration being collapsed and otherwise. So that would be the most flexible way to take um, that test. Yeah. So in, in general, I would say, you know, so that size density structures a good chunk of what ends up happening, but not, not all of it. So you're right, you could put in, you could, you could, put, you could put in a predictor for all 53 or so, which I would suggest you should do. No, don't, don't, don't do that. No, do it. I, 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 I want to see it. But uh, yeah, you could, in, in fact, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be interested to see what happens. But you could at least um, get a sense of where uh, of putting in, you know, you could put in factors for maybe not all of them, but for those, for those ones at least that are, you know, this chunk in terms of differentiating them. So that'd be one way of doing it. Okay, other questions before we get into the world's shortest R, R uh, tutorial? Yes? So are you, are you uh, asking the question as someone who is trying to collect data or already has the data and is trying to figure out how to model it? I'm trying to figure out how to model it. Okay, so the, the cheap answer is put in all the terms you have. <laughs> Why not? If it's not significant, it doesn't do anything, psh, there you go, random mixing, easy, solved. No, I, that, 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 that was the answer. No, uh, um, so yeah, so the, 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 the glib answer is you could, of course, estimate, so, as well, perhaps I, I should, maybe I'll add an ergum section to the, the an, an ego network part to the ergum uh, day on Thursday. Maybe, I'll think about it. If there's interest, I, I could. Um, so what you could do is uh, estimate an exponential random graph model on your ego network data and get a sense of where the important divisions are. I mean, it's sort of a data-driven approach, but you know, rather than, so, you, so before you actually start simulating things, you know, and trying to infer what the network looks like, you could just estimate the model and see what the parameters look like. And then you're in the world of 
you know, interpreting models, but this is sort of what we do, right? We can try to figure out what's an important dimension and, and what's not. And so I guess my, yeah, so my initial answer still stands. Uh, yeah, um, see what happens. If you don't have a good theoretical reason to do it and you're interested in just trying to make sure that the fit is a good one, then you should use, basically use as many attributes as possible, um, especially the just attributes. Those, those terms are pretty easy to fit and pretty easy to work with in terms of generating, um, generating networks. And so, yeah, I, I don't know, others may disagree, but I, I'd say uh, um, um, start there, estimate the models of the different parameters, different terms, and then see, see what it looks like. But we can chat afterwards if you, because uh, this is one of my, well, I spent a lot of time with this, so we can definitely chat. But um, okay, other, other questions? Going once. Okay, very good. Uh, we have a half hour. 